prior to the building of the new headquarters for the Massachusetts Medical Society in 1998, a committee was formed of society members, employees of the society, and members of the Alliance to collaborate with the building and landscape architects to design gardens for the new campus and an atrium garden to be located inside of the new building. Following the lead of the principal building architect, the committee and the landscape architect chose the same two themes for the gardens as the building architect had chosen for the building, nature and medical history and tradition. The ad hoc committee for landscape design approached the task with the mindset of designing gardens for the campus site rather than selecting foundation plantings, trees, shrubs, and ground covers to adorn a large building. The result is a number of gardens next to the building and throughout the campus that serve as a collection of garden short stories. They include a medicinal garden to tell the story of the great importance of plants in medical history and medical practice. The idea for the medicinal garden originated with Dr. Shirley McIva, whose vocation was a researcher and clinician in pulmonary diseases, and whose avocation was designing, creating, and maintaining gardens. Dr. McIva, a master gardener, had previously designed the herbal gardens of Plymouth Plantation and Heritage Plantation. She designed and created the Massachusetts Medical Society Medicinal Garden, dubbed Portus Medicus. Of all the gardens on the campus, the medicinal garden ranks as the signature one. It is an icon because it best symbolizes the society's healing and teaching missions. The medicinal garden also confers a unique sense of a medical place to the edifice that sets the Medical Society headquarters building apart from other corporate headquarters buildings. The name of the medicinal garden, Hortus Medicus, was chosen to evoke the history and to continue the tradition of European medicinal gardens of the early Renaissance. At that time, throughout all of Europe, every university that had a medical school had a medicinal garden tended by medical students. All the medicinal gardens were named Hortus Medicus because during that period, the language of instruction throughout all of Europe was Latin. It is not the purpose of our medicinal garden to recommend therapies. Our intent is to learn and to teach history and to remind us of the importance of medicinal plants. We do it by growing healthy specimens of them together in an aesthetically pleasing garden. The history of medicine cannot be told without including plants, some of which are medicinal, some of which had been thought to be medicinal but have been scientifically proven not to be, and some of which whose medicinal value is still in question. In addition, the garden includes medicinal plants no longer in use because other remedies have replaced them. All four categories are included in our garden for the purpose of learning and teaching history. Our garden includes approximately 100 plant selections that span five millennia of recorded medicinal plant history including Papaver somniferum, the opium poppy, which is the first plant to have its medicinal properties described and recorded. Hence, it is a good choice to start describing some of the medicinal plants we grow. The opium poppy, Papaver somniferum, indigenous to Turkey and Asia Minor, is the first medicinal plant to have its pharmacological properties described and recorded. The Sumerians who invented writing wrote about it on their clay tablets in approximately 3200 BCE. 
The opium poppy was called the joy poppy because the Sumerians discovered that the ingestion of the sap from the unripe poppy pods produced euphoria. They also discovered and described the other narcotic properties of opium, which are pain relief, sleep induction, coma, and death. The sap obtained from lancing the unripe poppy pod yields a white material resembling latex. It is dried in the sun or in an oven. Opium is the English word that comes from the Greek word for dry sap. Because it has the appearance of brown sugar, opium is often referred to as brown sugar in the legal and illegal trades of it. By 300 BCE, opium was consumed in the Greek, Roman, and Arabic cultures for medicinal, recreational, and criminal purposes. Agrippina, the fourth wife of the Roman Emperor Claudius, murdered Claudius's son with a fatal dose of opium dissolved in wine. She attempted to do the same to the emperor, but failed, and resorted to finishing the task with a meal of poisonous mushrooms. The murder of the emperor made it possible for her son Nero, who Agrippina had convinced Claudius to adopt, to become the emperor of Rome at the age of 17. Opium, dissolved in sherry, was introduced into medical practice in 1680 in England by Dr. Thomas Sydenham. The mixture was called laudanum, an English word coined from the Latin word laudate, which means praiseworthy. Laudanum was available worldwide for medicinal and recreational purposes for centuries without prescription. Laudanum production was discontinued in the United States by the FDA as a provision of the Harrison Food and Drug Act of 1914. Novels of the Victorian era contain numerous references to Laudanum, Lord Byron, Charles Dickens, John Keats, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, and Thomas De Quincey were acquainted with Laudanum. Elizabeth Barrett Browning consumed it to relieve persistent bone pain from tuberculosis of the spine. She came to recognize that she had become addicted to opium and wrote about her addiction to Robert Browning, referring to it as, quote, the red poppy, unquote. Paragoric is opium dissolved in alcohol and is sometimes referred to as a tincture of opium. Paragoric was introduced into medical practice by Jacob Lamont, a Dutch chemist in the early 1700s. Paragoric has been available worldwide without prescription for centuries. In the United States, it has been regulated by the FDA since 1914 as a provision of the Harrison Food and Drug Act. In 1803, Frederick Sertner, a German-Swiss pharmacist, began the process of identifying the natural organic compounds in opium. It went on for decades. There are approximately 40 natural organic compounds in opium, and they are collectively referred to as the opiates. The first isolated opiate was morphine, Sertner named morphine after Morpheus, the Greek god of dreams. Five of the approximately 40 opiates are medicinal. The medicinal opiates are morphine, codeine, papaverine, thebane, and noscopine. Papaverine is a blood vessel dilator which does not contain the narcotic properties that the other four medicinal opiates contain. 
Opioids are semi-synthetic derivatives of opiates. Heroin is a semi-synthetic derivative of morphine. Oxycodone is a semi-synthetic derivative of thebane, and hydrocodone is a semi-synthetic derivative of codeine. The term opioid is used loosely to include not only opiates and opioids, but also to include totally synthetic drugs that possess the narcotic properties of opiates and opioids. Two examples of completely synthetic drugs with narcotic properties that come under the broad umbrella of opioids are fentanyl and methadone. Two wars that have been come to be known as the Opium Wars of 1839 and 1865 have been fought between the United Kingdom and China over opium and for other reasons. Opium produced from poppies grown in India was sold by the UK in China. In opium dens, Chinese males smoked opium in clay pipes they shared that led not only to problems of widespread opium addiction, but also to the spread of pulmonary infectious diseases. The trade, outlawed by the Chinese, was very profitable on both sides and therefore impossible to eradicate. In addition to using the profits from selling opium to buy tea, silk, spices, jade, porcelain, ivory, ebony, and other luxury items, the UK wanted to develop markets to sell not only opium, but its cotton and woolen textiles as well. The Industrial Revolution in England was producing far more textiles than could be consumed nationally. The British were interested in developing global markets to deal with its excess manufacturing capacity but the Chinese at that time were not at all interested in free trade. Currently, Afghanistan accounts for 90% of the world's production of opium. Year after year, opium production accounts for 85 to 90% of the Afghanistan GDP. 97% of the opium produced in Afghanistan ends up in the illegal trade. Only 3% ends up in the legal trade for the extraction of medicinal opiates and the production of semi-synthetic opioids. Attempts by the American government to encourage the cultivation of pomegranate trees instead of opium poppies has failed thus far. It is deemed that Afghanistan grows the best pomegranates in the world. However, American efforts to urge poppy production be replaced with pomegranate cultivation have been unsuccessful thus far. The description of the properties of medicinal plants in the fine arts is sometimes correct and sometimes incorrect, but always interesting. Frank Baum's classic, The Wizard of Oz, which was written in 1900, attributes a medicinal property to the pollen of opium poppies that it does not have. Baum probably got his idea from the Latin botanical name Papava somniferum that translates into English as the sleep-producing poppy. In his story, Dorothy and her friends are making their way to Emerald City on the winding yellow brick road when the wicked witch of the West sees them. With evil intent, she entices them to leave the road to take a shortcut across a vast field of opium poppies. Dorothy and her friends fall asleep in the poppy field. Thankfully, Gertrude, the good witch of the North, observes what is taking place and, fearing the worst, causes a blizzard to occur. The snow clears the air of all the pollen, allowing Dorothy and her friends to awaken and continue their journey to Emerald City. 
Opium pollen does not induce sleep. It possesses no narcotic properties whatsoever. Opium poppy seeds contain only trace amounts of opium that are undetectable. But opium poppy seeds eaten on bagels, in muffins, or in salad dressings will produce a false positive test for marijuana. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, an ophthalmologist and a detective story author who was better known as Sherlock Holmes after the name of the character he created, correctly describes the medicinal properties of opium. In his short story, Silver Blaze, Mr. Straka feeds a meal of mutton heavily laced with opium dust to a watchdog guarding the stables of the prize-winning racehorses. After the watchdog falls into a coma, Mr. Straka lacerates a hoof tendon of the racehorse Silver Blaze. A great commotion ensues in the barn that the watchdog is unaware of because of his comatose state. Hence, the watchdog was not able to bark to alert anyone to the crime. This short story is the source of the metaphor, the dog that did not bark, to describe a situation in which what is normally expected to happen does not occur at all. Papaveroeus has several common names, such as the Flanders poppy because of the poem in Flanders Field, and the corn poppy because of its uninvited presence as a weed in the corn fields and wheat fields of Europe in the early 20th century. It also grows in great profusion in meadows and cemeteries. The Flanders poppy is medicinal, but it contains only 10% of the concentration of opiates compared to Papaver somniferum, the opium poppy. Hence, it is not used in the legal or illegal opium trade. But the red petals of the blossoms have been used to render a natural red color to pediatric cough syrups. Lieutenant Colonel John McRae, a World War I Canadian physician, surgeon, and poet, wrote the famous poem in Flanders Fields upon request to memorialize the death in combat of a comrade. He recited the poem at the great side service of his fallen friend. Friends urged him to publish the poem, but initially he demurred. After more than a year, he yielded it to their wishes and the poem became an instant international success. It is ranked as the most important poem of World War I literature. In 1922, the Veterans of Foreign Wars created a Buddy Poppy program and adopted the Flanders Poppy as its memorial flower. It became a symbol of the supreme patriotic human self-sacrifice. Imitation poppies are sold as boutonnieres to support the needs of American veterans of all wars and their families. In the United States, they are traditionally sold in May, in time for the observance of Memorial Day, and to a lesser extent for the observance of Veterans Day, November 11. The poppy boutonniere is a very strong tradition in Canada and Great Britain, and is worn in the days leading to November 11, Armistice Day. Monet painted Flanders poppy fields over and over again, and so did Van Gogh. Van Gogh painted them growing in wheat fields and growing in rows in cornfields between the rows of corn stalks. Van Gogh also painted them in flower arrangements by themselves and in floral compositions. In 1958, Dr. Robert Noble and Dr. Thomas Beer of the University of Western Ontario began an investigation of the claim that drinking Madagascar periwinkle tea is an alternative to the injection of insulin in the treatment of diabetes. However, 
Their research did not substantiate the claim. They identified 70 natural organic alkaloids in the Madagascar periwinkle. Two of the 70, vincristine and vinblastine, proved to have medicinal value. They injected extracts from the leaves of the Madagascar periwinkle into the veins of rabbits and mice. The rabbits died from infection and at the time of death were found to have no white blood cells, which are necessary to fight infection. Doctors Noble and Bia saw a clue that treatment or a cure may have been discovered for leukemia, a medical disorder in which malfunctioning white blood cells are formed in great excess with fatal consequences. What organic molecule or molecules were responsible for the suppression of the production of white blood cells. Their laboratory research led to the identification and extraction of vincristine and vinblastine. They are natural organic molecules that were clinically proven to be anti-mitotic and effective in the treatment of childhood lymphoma and leukemia, neuroblastoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, and testicular cancer. First and second generation semi-synthetic derivatives of vinblastine are effective chemotherapeutic agents in many other cancers, including melanoma, breast cancer, and lung cancer. Vindicin and vinrelvin are semi-synthetic derivatives of vinoblastin. Vinoflunin is a semi-synthetic derivative of vinorelbin. They are effective chemotherapeutic agents in many other cancers, including melanoma, breast cancer, and lung cancer. Pedophilotoxin is a lignin extracted from the rhizome of Pedophilum peltatum, the may apple and is used externally to remove plantar warts. It is very toxic. Semi-synthetic derivatives of pedophilotoxin, etoposide and tinoposide, are less toxic and administered intravenously to treat a large variety of malignancies. Etoposide is used in the treatment of testicular, lung, and ovarian cancers leukemia, lymphoma, Kaposi and Ewing sarcomas, neuroblastoma, and glioblastoma multiforme. Tinoposide is used in the treatment of childhood acute lymphocytic leukemia, Hodgkin's lymphoma, malignant lymphoma, glioblastoma, ependymoma, neuroblastoma, astrocytoma, and bladder cancer. Hippocrates used the root of peonies to treat anxiety states, menstrual disorders, and epilepsy. The root contains an antispasmodic pianoflorin, which relaxes the gastrointestinal muscle and uterine muscle. In labor, it relaxes the uterine muscle and counters oxytocin. Theophrastus named the peony after Paeon, the physician to the Greek gods. Paeon was a human, so it is of interest that the Greek gods chose a human to care for them and not one of their peers, Asclepius, the god of medicine. Officinalis Officinale and officinarum are Latin adjectives that all mean used in the practice of medicine in the past, in the present, or both. The difference in spelling is accounted for by the rules of Latin grammar, which require the adjective to agree in number, case, and gender with the noun it modifies. Peonies are indigenous to southern Europe, principally Greece and Turkey. 
it appears that peonies made their way to China on the return trips of the camel caravans on the 7,000-mile Silk Road from Istanbul back to Beijing. Peonies are first described in Chinese medical textbooks in 100 BCE and continue today to have a place in the Chinese medicine concept of yin-yang medicine. Yin-yang is a concept that a proper balance between excitation and relaxation is an important component of good health. Too much of one or not enough of the other results in an imbalance that should be corrected. For example, if one is overly anxious, then one has too much yang and needs a yin preparation to calm down and to restore the proper balance. Or, if one is too relaxed and unable to engage in the mental or physical activity desired, one needs a yang preparation to become energized and to restore the proper balance. Just as Hippocrates used the root of the peony to calm his patients, so do the Chinese in the 21st century use of the root of the peony as a yin preparation. The peony specimens of choice in current use are Peonia officinalis, alba plena, the white medicinal peony, and Peonia sufructicosa rinkaku, the white tree peony. There are innumerable varieties of peonies, eight of which have officinalis as the species designation in their Latin botanical name. It may be that all peonies are medicinal. The Latin botanical name for yarrow, Achillea millifolium, honors Achilles, the hero of the Iliad by Homer. Achilles sustained many injuries in combat. He treated all of them successfully with the leaves and blossoms of yarrow, except for the arrow injury to his right heel that did not respond to yarrow treatment and proved to be fatal. Achilles was the son of Thetis, a sea nymph, who soon after his birth held him upside down by the right heel and dipped him into the river Styx to render him immortal. The right heel did not get into the river, so he remained vulnerable in that part of his anatomy. Somehow, Paris, the Trojan prince and warrior who abducted Helen, knew about Achilles' vulnerability and inflicted an arrow wound into the right heel. Achilles treated his wound with yarrow to no avail and died from complications of the wound. In the Middle Ages, nosebleeds were treated by stuffing a nostril with leaves of yarrow and gastrointestinal bleeding was treated with the ingestion of its leaves. The fall crocus, also known as the meadow saffron, has the appearance of, but is not related to the crocus that blooms in the early spring. It is a member of the lily family. In the spring, its leaves emerge, but by early summer, the leaves turn yellow collapse and disintegrate. In the fall, the blossoms emerge from the soil without any leaves. This important plant, Cochicine autumnalis, has been recognized to be medicinal since 1500 BCE. Its medicinal properties are described in the Egyptian medical Eber papyri. In the first century BCE, Discorides recommended its use in the treatment of arthritis. By the 5th century, it became known that it is useful in treating cases of arthritis if the pain and swelling of the joints were not the result of injury or infection, as is the case with gouty arthritis. The quorum of this plant contains medicinal organic alkaloids Colchicine and others. 
Colchicine reduces the inflammation resulting from an increased level of uric acid in joint fluid. It prevents accumulation of uric acid in the serum and prevents uric acid crystallization in the renal tubules that can lead to uric acid stone formation in the renal calyx, the ureters, and the bladder. While in Paris, serving as an American ambassador to France, Benjamin Franklin was treated with colchicine. Colchicine was not available in the United States, so upon his return home, he brought back corms of colchicine autumnale, also known as colchicine melanthioides. Benjamin Franklin may have been the first American to have been treated for gout with colchicine. Several members of the chrysanthemum family are alleged to have medicinal properties. Tanacetin patheneum, also known as chrysanthemum patheneum, has been proven to be a medicinal plant. A tea made from its leaves is an old effective treatment for migraine headaches and other disorders. The substance in the leaves has been identified and given the name parthenolide. Parthenolide prevents or diminishes and delays the release of the hormone serotonin from the brain, thereby decreasing the intensity and duration of migraine headaches. The common name, feverfew, is an English word that comes from febrifuge, an old Elizabethan medical term for fever reduction. The current term for febrifuge is antipyretic. The plant's fever-reducing properties account for its common name, feverfew. Several plants have St. John for or as part of their common name because these plants and shrubs can be relied upon to be in bloom on June 24, the feast day of St. John the Baptist. Hypericum perforatum, St. John's wort, is used for the treatment of mild depression. Hypericin, present in the flowers and leaves, is also strongly antiviral and has been studied for the possibility of use in the treatment of HIV and AIDS. Hypericum proliferum, St. John's shrub, is not a medicinal plant. Ernst Fuchs, a German ophthalmologist, created the Latin botanical name for the foxglove by combining a portion of the Latin word for finger, digitus, and attaching to it the Latin suffix alus to create the word digitalis, which means possessing the characteristic of a finger. His idea came from the German word fingerhut, the German word for thimble. To Fuchs, the blossoms of the foxglove resembled a thimble. The story of how the foxglove was discovered to be an important treatment for certain cardiac disorders is a monumental classic in medical history and literature. It resulted in the publication of An Account of the Foxglove and Some of Its Medical Uses with Practical Remarks on Dropsy and Other Diseases by Dr. William Withering in 1785. For many reasons, the publication of this book was one of the most important of its genre of the 18th century medical literature. Dr. William Withering was a general practitioner who practiced in Birmingham, England. Like his peers, he was a botanist. Until approximately two centuries ago, all physicians were botanists, herbalists, and all botanists were physicians. As was the case with his peers, he had very little success 
treating dropsy with herbal remedies. Dropsy is an old medical term that refers to a group of medical disorders that have in common an abnormal collection of fluid in the body, the extremities, the lungs, the chest cavity, the abdominal cavity, and the pericardium, a sac surrounding the heart. It is caused by heart failure, kidney failure, liver failure, or a combination of any two, or a combination of all three. It is usually progressive and often fatal. Physicians treated the disorder with herbal preparations made of a mixture of plants that grew in their herbal gardens and or plants they collected in the wild with very little success. On occasion, as a last resort, frustrated physicians offered desperately ill patients and their families the services of an English housewife with no medical training. She has come to be known in medical history as Mrs. Hutton. Mrs. Hutton tended an herbal garden and collected plant specimens from the wild as well. She would treat patients with her herbal preparations with equally poor results, but on rare occasions, patients experienced a remarkable improvement or recovery from near fatal dropsy. On several occasions, Dr. Withering observed the astonishing improvement of the patient under treatment and became very suspicious that Mrs. Hutton had an effective ingredient in her herbal mix that neither he nor his peers had in theirs. He asked Mrs. Hutton what herbal ingredients constituted her mixture, but she refused to tell him. He was so convinced she had something of great value that no one else had. He was determined to find out what it was. He spied on her and discovered Tuesday morning was her plant collection day. He canceled all his office appointments on one Tuesday and arose in the middle of the night in order to arrive at her home before dawn. Dr. Withering hid in shrubs near her house and waited until she left to make her regular plant collections in the wild. He followed her without ever being seen by hiding at a distance behind trees and boulders. After she had harvested a specimen and moved on to the next, he quickly followed her to take a sample of what she had just picked. In this manner, he followed her to the next area of collection. This hide-and-seek went on for half a day. At the end of this session, Dr. Withering returned to his office with more than 20 plant specimens in his bag. He spread the plants out on his workbench and rejected all but one, the foxglove. From his own experience, he knew all the others were therapeutically worthless. He then designed a method to go about proving or disproving the therapeutic value of foxglove in the treatment of dropsy. Dr. Withering studied the foxglove not by adding it to his own herbal mix, but by using it alone in the treatment of 163 dropsy patients over a period of 10 years. He experimented with dry specimens of the roots, the stems, the leaves, and the blossoms separately. He kept very careful records of his patients that provided the data for his conclusions. The case studies, data, and the conclusions of his clinical research were published in his famous book. The book had an immediate and an enormous influence on medical practice in Europe and the United States. Dr. Withering arrived at several conclusions. One, foxglove preparations of all parts of the plant are toxic. Two, all parts of the foxglove have therapeutic 
value. Three, the leaves are the most potent of all plant parts, especially if they are harvested when the plant is in bloom. Four, digitalis leaf preparations are effective in the treatment of dropsy when the cause is heart failure. Five, digitalis preparations are not effective in the treatment of dropsy if the cause is kidney or liver failure. And six, digitalis preparations are effective because they are diuretic. Dr. Withering's sixth conclusion was proven later to be incorrect. He arrived at this conclusion because he observed a great increase in urinary output in his patients under treatment with digitalis. It was later proven that the diuretic effect of cardiac glycosides is secondary to the increase in the strength of the recovering heart muscle. As the cardiac output increased, the renal function improved. Better renal function increased the urine volume. The natural organic molecules present in nearly all species of the genus Digitalis are referred to as a group as the cardiac glycosides because they all have in common glucose as a part of their molecule. The cardiac glycosides are digitoxin, digoxin, and the linatocytes. Because digoxin has the shortest duration of action and is the easiest to quantify in serum, it is the safest. It is currently the cardiac glycoside of choice and the only one prescribed in the United States. Of all of the digitalis species, digitalis lanata is the commercial digitalis plant of choice because it has the highest concentration of digoxin of them all. Dr. Withering's book caused an international, irrational exuberance. If digitalis preparations are so good for heart failure, they must be good for many other things. This was a prevailing thought in medical circles. Without clinical trials, claims of the therapeutic value of digitalis preparation were made for a large number and variety of medical disorders. The Hanuman Pharmacopoeia, published in the mid-19th century, listed 70 med medical conditions, including epilepsy, that could be treated with digitalis preparations. Epilepsy cannot be treated successfully with digitalis. The cardiac glycosides are an effective treatment only for chronic congestive heart failure and certain cardiac arrhythmias, that is, abnormal heartbeats. In the era of irrational exuberance, Vincent van Gogh was treated for epilepsy with digitalis while he was a patient in an insane asylum. Following his discharge from the asylum, van Gogh became a patient of Dr. Paul Gachet. The excellent doctor-patient relationship that developed has been memorialized by two famous paintings of this physician by his very grateful patient. In both paintings, against Dr. Gachet's will, the artist has him holding a cutting of digitalis purpurea in his left hand. Patient records exist and show no evidence that Dr. Gachet treated Van Gogh with digitalis. It appears that Dr. Gachet treated his patient only with talk therapy by listening compassionately to numerous accounts of all the devils that tormented his mentally ill patient. It seems, however, Van Gogh knew about the popularity of digitalis for the treatment of many disorders and perceived the Fox Club to be a symbol of the medical profession in the same way we now perceive the staff of Aesculapius to be such. Hence, Van Gogh's insistence on the Fox Club in the portraits. One of the portraits of Dr. Gachet sold at auction, Christie's, 
in New York on May 15, 1990 for $82.5 million. A Japanese industrialist who became the 13th owner purchased the portrait. He took it to Japan and hid it. He has since died and the portrait is still missing. Question remains, did Digitalis treatment affect Van Gogh's painting? One of the signs of Digitalis toxicity is xanthopsia, defined as a yellowing of vision. Van Gogh's unusual and very generous use of yellow in many of his paintings is well known. The sky in Olive Grove is an example. Vincent Van Gogh painted sunflowers 27 times. There is no evidence to prove Van Gogh knew that the common sunflower, Helianthus anonuus, is a medicinal plant. Did painting in yellow, a cheerful color, give him psychological comfort? Or was it somehow a sign of digitalis toxicity? There is no evidence to prove the direct correlation of the use of yellow in his paintings and digitalis therapy toxicity. Lavendula officinalis, English lavender, is one of the most important plants in the armamentarium of aromatherapy. Aromatherapy is predicated on the concept that things that smell good make you feel good. The core of the very profitable perfume industry. There is a neurophysiological basis for the idea. Pleasant aromas stimulate the release of dopamine, the pleasure hormone from the midbrain. The etymology of the Latin word lavendula, from which comes the English word lavender, tells the aromatherapy story very well. In classical Rome, Romans took long baths in spring-fed heated swimming pools called the lawatios, not only to bathe, but also to relax. To enhance the pleasure of the bathing experience, they floated sprigs of fragrant blooming lavender in the bath water. Over time, lawatio, classical Latin, underwent a word change to lavendula, medieval Latin. Botanists took lavendula for the genus designation in the lineal system of plant taxonomy. From lavatio comes the English word lavatory, and from lavendula comes the English word lavender. The leaves of lavender are antiseptic and strongly antiviral. The essential oil contains 40 volatile organic molecules that have been studied for a possible treatment of HIV and AIDS. In the Middle Ages, dried blossoms and sleep pillows were used to treat insomnia, depression, anxiety states, and migraine headaches. The dried blossoms and essential oils are currently used in a large variety of products that include soap, sachets, body lotions, shampoos, and mists. The Oswego Indians of Western Upstate New York introduced Monada Didyma, the bee bomb, to the 17th century English settlers as a beverage making no claims that it possessed medicinal properties. Oswego tea made from the dry leaves of bee balm became a popular beverage in the colonies until tea was imported to the colonies by the British and others. The British stubbornly continued to tax tea after being forced to remove other taxes on other imports. In addition to maintaining the onerous tax on tea, the Crown granted the British East India Company a monopoly with predictable consequences. As tea prices rose, enraged housewives in all colonies joined forces in a class action to boycott the purchase of imported tea and reverted to the consumption of Oswego tea 
after the Boston Tea Party on December 16, 1773. Bankruptcy of the British East India Company quickly ensued. The Boston Tea Party is memorialized in many works of art. The fresco in the National Capital Rotunda is an example. The Quakers attributed medicinal properties to bee balm and used the dry leaves for the treatment of pulmonary and menstrual disorders. The leaves contain thymol, a strong fungal and bacterial antiseptic used in the past by dentists to sterilize a previously prepared cavity before the placement of an amalgam restoration. Currently, thymol is used in commercial mouthwash formulas to decrease the number of bacteria populating the mouth associated with tooth decay and bad breath. The butterfly weed is indigenous to North America. The Omaha Indians used it to treat pulmonary tuberculosis, asthma, pneumonia, bronchitis, and eczema. The Latin botanical name Asclepius, the Greek god of medicine, indicates it has a medicinal use. Tuberosa indicates that its medicinal ingredients, the cardiac glycosides and plant estrogens, reside in the roots. Lydia E. Pinkham of Lynn, Massachusetts, in 1875, created a secret herbal mixture she named and had patented as Lydia E. Pinkham's vegetable compound. It was available over the counter without prescription and advertised as a remedy for, quote, women's troubles, sick headaches, and nervous breakdowns, unquote. Her home remedy enjoyed enormous popularity and made her a millionaire. In 1960, the FDA mandated the cessation of its production and sale because all the over-the-counter preparations henceforth were required to reveal all the ingredients in labels and in advertising. It was determined that the liquid mixture was a preparation of the root of the butterfly weed and four other herbs suspended in 21% alcohol. The questions to be answered are, was it so popular because of the alcohol, the plant estrogens, or a combination of the two? A placebo effect is another possibility. Rosa Gallica officinalis translates into English as the French rose used in the practice of medicine. It is not French, but it has a French connection. It is indigenous to Iran and was brought back to France from Persia by French knights returning from the Crusades during the 11th and 13th centuries. In France, it was first cultivated in monastic gardens and eventually elsewhere. The essential oils from the petals are used in aromatherapy as a mildly sedative antidepressant remedy and in ointments to render them a pleasant fragrance. Dried flower petals are also used in aromatherapy for depression. The rose petals are used in putpourri alone or in combination with other dried flowers and sometimes with spices. In the Napoleonic era, this rose was grown in flower pots at the front doors of apothecary shops accounting for the common name of this rose to be the apothecary rose. Just as today, the red and white striped pole indicates the location of a barber shop, the apothecary rose growing in a pot on the sidewalk by the entrance indicated the location of an apothecary shop in Paris and elsewhere in France. Rosa rugosa translates from Latin into English as the wrinkled rose. 
the rose is named as such because of the wrinkled appearance of its leaves it is indigenous to asia and was brought to our eastern seaboard in the 19th century on homeward bound yankee merchant clipper ships of the china trade it is very high hardy and thrives in most soil conditions but it appears to do especially well in the wild on the sand dunes of new england beaches in china tea made from the leaves is thought to be medicinal and is consumed to improve blood circulation the rose hips have the highest concentration of vitamin c in nature even exceeding the concentration of vitamin c in all of the citrus fruits rosa rugosa qualifies as a nutraceutical as defined by dr de felice as quote a food or a part of a food that produces health benefits including the prevention and or the treatment of a disease trapellum maius the nasturtium is also a nutraceutical its leaves and blossoms are edible and have a high concentration of vitamin c the white water lily nymphia alba is medicinal in all its parts in the past preparations made from the flower petals were used to induce sedation in the treatment of insomnia and anxiety the leaves to treat irritable bowel syndrome dysentery and diarrhea and the rhizomes as an astringent and antiseptic jean-claude monet painted white water lilies repeatedly in all seasons all hours of the day and in all kinds of weather his white water lily canvases are as much about the landscapes and the skyscapes viewed in the reflections from the water surface as they are about the lilies themselves as a result each panel evokes a different mood did monet know the nipia alba the white water lily is a medicinal plant probably not the great impressionist was also a great gardener this is what he had to say about himself apart from painting and gardening i am good for nothing my greatest masterpiece is my garden everyone is welcome to visit our medicinal garden however before your visit we recommend you read about it on our website and take a virtual tour in all human existence there has been a constant search for plant materials to ingest to ensure growth to maintain good health and to prolong survival humans have successfully used these materials some of which contain both nutritional factors and medicinal properties to alleviate pain and suffering and to prevent and cure diseases you are invited to contemplate on these life-sustaining matters as you stroll through our garden.